Howdy, yokes, and welcome back to Bacon and Eggs! I'm Tyler Carlin. And I'm Ethan Edge Hill. And we're going back to school! Or shall I compare these to a summer's day? So, carpe diem, lads. And sound your barbaric yop. Because today we're bringing you... Dead Poets Society. Dead Poets Society. Now, Ethan, I want to run down some stats. Okay. We're going to run a positive and negative review. Okay. And then we're going to completely change the subject. Okay. And then we're going to give a binary review. And then we're going to talk about the movie. Okay. Did you enjoy watching this movie? I did. Oh my God, me too. Every time. Now, Ethan, this movie was released June 2nd, 1989. That was 10,686 days ago. And like three years and six months before I was born. Or two years and six months. I don't know how time worked. Yeah, I was couple, born in 92. Years. Yeah. It's the year Taylor Swift was born. I don't know if you know that or not. I did know that, 1989. I think I think that's why. This movie, shoestring, $16.4 million budget, made $235.9 million worldwide, got an 84% critic rating on Rotten Tomatoes, 92% audience rating, and a 79 on Metacritic, which all seem like criminally low scores from me. I would agree with that. Also, this movie was never the number one movie. Fun fact. Really? Yeah. In the in the box offices. I don't remember what beat it, but it never well, you took... There. Ne not even in the in the time it was out did it take the number one spot interesting yeah that's a very interesting little, little at least not in the u.s it did like a lot better overseas than it did in the states weird i i remember watching this movie and thinking to myself this isn't how prep schools are in the u.s but i didn't go to a prep school so i really have no idea it is from is everything it? i've read yeah well it, and that was my like initial thought watching it was like i i turned it on and i was like is this set in England? No. It's set in your... Well, I don't know where it's set. It never. It's never specific about where it's set, but it was filmed in your favorite place in the whole world. Delaware. No way. I believe that. It was filmed totally at, at St. Saint Augustine School in Delaware or something like that. Interesting. St. Andrew's quite... School in Delaware. There we go. Um... Do you have a negative review for this movie? I do. Jonathan Rosenbaum of the Chicago Reader says, The moral divisions set up between characters are childishly overdrawn, and worst of all, the behavior shown by the boys and adults frequently reeks of falsity and contrivance. I don't like Jonathan Rosenbaum. I yeah, like, you gotta, could you not gotta, like, disagree open with a dictionary. This more. You gotta open a dictionary to figure out that review. You do, but I, I also know that he didn't get it. No. At all. Under like no circumstances. He, he missed the point. Entirely. Like, the, the point is that it's told from the perspective of a couple of high school boys. Specifically, Todd Anderson. Right. And, like, the reason everything seems so overdrawn is because of his like, nervousness and anxiety. And Yeah, you're absolutely right. We'll, we'll the get dude to that totally very missed shortly. It. Yeah, he missed the boy yeah. completely. Missed the mark entirely. Uh, my, my review comes from the Variety staff. I guess they don't give, uh, what is that called in newspapers when, when you get your name featured? I have no idea. Oh, uh, byline. They newspapers don't give bylines dead variety. Variety. No, nah, newspapers are real, man. By the way, newspaper editor, writer, staff person, do you need somebody to write film reviews? I'm available. I'm totally available. Just hit me up, bro. Baconxmedia at gmail.com. I'll write them all. Anyway, and the Variety staff says, The story sings whenever Williams is on screen. Screen belongs just as often to Leonard, who, as Neil, has a quality of darting confidence mixed with hesitancy. Hawk, as the painfully shy Todd, gives a haunting performance. <laughs> performance. A hunting performance. <laughs> a haunting performance. I was laughing at myself for how I said shy as the painfully shy Todd. <laughs> That, then I was thinking about Len. Delaware. <laughs> Len. Oh, man. Uh, but I like what Variety staff has to say. I think that they're right. I think that Ethan Hawke and Robin Williams and Robert Sean Leonard all give amazing performances in this film. Um, and there's there's much to be said for them. Absolutely. That's that's the point I wanted to make. Now, before we dive, I want to do the binary review real quick. I know I, I said it differently earlier, but we're going to go straight okay. to the binary It's a one. Review. It's a one. He's every day of the week. Yeah, every day uh -huh. of the week. This is a very important movie. This is a very important movie, not only to everyone, but but also to me, who's more important than everyone, and I think that matters, you know? Yes, that's exactly anyway. what I'm saying. Exactly, exactly. All right, so, orange juice and toothpaste, Ethan. Orange juice and toothpaste, I'm ready. Yeah, are you ready? Yep. All right, three, two, one, peer Debit pressure. cards. Debit cards. Debit cards. I'm curious about yours first. So, as you know, I moved last week, right? Yes. Can uh, we get new debit cards, by the way? What? Can we get new debit cards? I'm not satisfied with our bank. Okay, sure. Anyway. <laughs> Whatever. Not concerned cool. about that right now. All right. Um, so I moved last week, which involved uh, driving, uh, taking the, the van and trailer that my band has and driving it 250 miles. 
What? Van, no, Wilder? Van Wilder? Yeah, talking about Van Wilder. And driving it 250 miles to Roanoke and then 250 miles back to my apartment and then uh, driving my car 250 miles back across the state. Now, in this time, I bought a bunch of gas because the van gets like nine miles a gallon when it's got a fully loaded trailer. There so you I bought, go. A, bought a bunch of gas. Oh, also, in addition, uh, the van has a broken gas cage. Nice. So we never have any idea how much gas is in it. So the the general rule we we choose to follow is to fill it up every 125 to 150 miles, just in case. Because when you run out of gas on a drawbridge in Mystic, Connecticut, you start to rethink a few things about your life. Right. Uh, anyway, so fill it up every 125 miles, uh, and, and it never put that much gas in it. So I'm buying 15, 20 dollars worth of gas, you know, every two hours, essentially. And apparently that raised some flags with Wells Fargo to the point where they just kind of shut my account off. Like entirely. Yeah, they, like, froze my account for 24 hours, uh, sent me an email saying, Hey, by the way, uh, we noticed some suspicious activity on your account. Somebody's buying a lot of gas, but, like, not too much gas, but very frequently. It's apparently a pattern conclusive with somebody that is, uh, that is stealing a debit card. So they just shut it down. And I found that, that happened... out in line at Zaxby's. Well, that really does happen. We've had, I, lo- I lost a uh, company credit card because somebody kept buying $50 Visa check cards with my company credit card at Walmart. Yeah. Uh, and I guess I, I just did it in such a specific pattern that, that raised this automatic alarm where, like, I didn't get a phone call about it. They just shut it off. Right. They were like, there's no way. There's no way he's doing this on right, purpose. Right, because I, I would go buy $20 worth of gas and, like, $3.50 worth of water inside right. <laughs> every two hours, essentially, for 24 hours. Nice. So, well done. So, yeah, I found out in the line at Zaxby's that my card was shut down. And the guy's like, yeah, it's declined. And I'm like, it better not be declined. There's money there. Right. That's always such an embarrassing experience when that happens. Like, it happened to me at a McDonald's the other day the guy was like cards declined and i was like man it just isn't like just take the card right like when my credit cards are declined i'm like yeah whatever okay here's another credit card when it's my debit card i'm like oh my god do i not have money right am i dying what am i going to do and then i look at my account and there's money there and i'm just like jesus christ anyway so i had another guy to... another card and checked my email and sure enough wells fargo was like yeah by the way we shut your account off because you bought gas 11 times in two days right anyway that's my that's my toothpaste that's the thing that got on my nerves the most toothpaste and orange juice indeed what is yours what did you say i didn't even hear you i said peer pressure peer pressure tell me about that honestly i don't even know where to go with this i just feel like the way it was taught to me in high school was in such a exaggerated ridiculous way that i would always see like the the health class movies and i would be like okay but that doesn't really happen and then i would like leave class and my friends would pressure me into doing something and it would happen all the freaking time right but it never happened on in the way that you thought it was going to it was never some guy came up to you and was just like hey tyler you want to do a bunch of crack right behind the building after school right now i'll beat you up yeah you're not cool if you don't do crack with me right It was like very normal things that just, you know, ballooned into... Yeah, we've told our stories with underage drinking here before on the podcast, and people come up to us and be like, hey, you want to go get drunk? And we're like, no, not really. Okay, cool, see you later. Yeah, I'm not, uh, More not, for me. not that interested. Yeah. But as an adult, man, if somebody's like, we're doing tequila shots, there is no escaping that. Oh, yeah. I, I At the beginning, that was my New Year's resolution this year, actually, was to not do any shots that I didn't want to. What a, what a grown man's resolution. And I've stuck to that because I hate shots. I hate doing shots. It's I, I, I don't enjoy it almost ever. There's I don't think there's ever been a shot where I've been like, yeah, that was nice. I enjoyed that. that. A, I want to do that another was one. a good one. Yeah, let's, yeah we let's used do to make some round. We used to make some pretty floofy shots shots back in college that was a whole different thing when you you know you're mixing doubles of you know the what was it 99 apples the the liquor that bites back oh yeah and oh, yeah. uh and fireball that's a whole different thing but then you know you're you're 25 years old and you're at the bar with your friends and somebody's like let's do a tequila shot and you're sitting there kind of like man i really don't want to do a tequila shot right now and the 11 other people are like man look at this guy i don't want to do a tequila shot like this is the thing they told me would happen to me in 11th grade yeah and then somebody's like if you don't do a tequila shot with me right now i'm going to take you outside and beat you up behind the dumpster I mean, none of my friends ever say that to me, but... (laughs) They don't say that to you? No. I got into it with a couple of my coworkers on the, the trip we took to the Dominican, though, where they were just like, what do you mean you want to stop drinking? And I'm like, it's been 27 hours now that we haven't stopped drinking, and I feel like trash. I'm going to bed. And they're just like, man, you're such a... <laughs> yep, you're yes, exactly right. You figured me out. But now, that was my night. that was my 2018 resolution is to not do any shots I didn't want to do, and I think I've only lost it once. Well, I'm proud of you, Ethan. I don't think I've done a shot in 2018. So I mean, I've been to a fair few parties. I've been to a lot of parties. I went to a party last night with you, and not one time was somebody like, "Hey, shots." If those are the parties you go to, your parties are a little bit more grown up than the parties I'm used to. They're definitely the parties I go. There are always children at the parties I go to. Yeah, when your brother was like, "How many beers can you drink?" and I was like, "A bunch." <laughs> yeah yeah there and he was are just always like, what is that like and i'm like i don't awful. know <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't Terrible. really notice it, tell you the truth. Well, um, I want to get into the film. All right, let's get into the film then. Ethan, I love this movie. I love this movie. I've always think, loved this movie. I think it is shot brilliantly. I think Robin Williams changed my life both growing up and yesterday when I watched it again. And... I think that it is one of the most brilliant movies I've ever watched. I think that, uh, you know, Seamus said it best. Neil's death is finna woke, bro. (laughs) (laughs) I forgot he said that. I forgot he said that. There's a lot of things that are very important about this movie for somebody that is like 15 years old to watch. I totally agree. And it, it's a weird, it's a tough thing because do you, do you think Neil's reasoning makes sense? No. For for the ending. No, I really don't. But it's and, and that's not that let me get this out of the way very quickly. It's like I'm not going to take or tell anybody their reason for why they commit suicide isn't good enough because obviously it is in their head. It's like people people do that all the time for for reasons that we wouldn't necessarily say are, you know, super above board, but it I don't know if the movie necessarily did the best job of selling me on Neil being that busted up about it. I think I think it was about like the fact that he had learned that he could do whatever. There's actually a film very recently that came out. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but it's very similar themes and is like unbelievably similar. Have you seen Crazy Rich Asians yet? No. Oh, it's very good. Um, but one of the themes in that movie is tradition versus individuality, and it's uh, it was just very interesting. It was like about the sacrifices that people make so that their family can thrive, and I think that that's sort of what we're seeing here is that Neil comes from this you know not super well off family. And they give him every opportunity in the world to succeed in the ways that they never could. And he wants to do, you know, obviously something else. Right. And that's a super real thing that happens. I've known plenty of people, especially in college, that were like, yeah, I have, I'm doing this because my parents told me I had to. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. I'm we just meet like, people well, all the time. But you want to be something else. Why don't you do that? And I was like, well, my dad gave me this opportunity that he was never afforded. And I'm like, cool. He should be proud of you. Yeah, that's sort of one of the things that confused me at our liberal arts college was like, I mean, for some of the more like artistic programs you need to audition to get in, but you can study like whatever you want. Yeah, pretty much. And they always tell the stories of like, you know, the student that graduated top of his class at MIT got into med school, or not MIT, but the student graduated top of his class at Harvard, got into Harvard on, on a drama undergrad degree. Right. It's like, do whatever you want in undergrad. It really doesn't matter. Like, the, well, most it people- matters if you- if your passion is a trade, then it kind of matters. Right. But, like, if you want to be a doctor, it's like, yeah, most people that are doctors have pre-med degrees, but, like, it's definitely not all of them. And if you ask any med school counselor, they're going to be like, yeah, it's really just about your essay and your scores and your GPA. It's kind of yeah. all we care about. It's I'm like, not going to med school. Are, are you capable of handling <laughs> med school is really all they're worried about. Right, because you're going to learn the med school part of it. Like, like there's no undergrad that I would be like, you know, you did do pre-med. I would allow you to operate on me. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> and I mean, I get that it's, it's really good to have some of those prerequisites. Like, if you had, you know, a whole year's worth of, like, anatomy training before you went into med school, it can't hurt. And it's one less thing they have to actually teach you in med school. It's just kind of like a baseline knowledge that you can get in with. But it, it generally, even if you if you don't have those prerequisites, they'll be like, hey, just take these over the summer and you're good. Right. But, yeah, but I- th- there's a big, and, and especially with our generation where we're becoming more and more there's more and more pressure on these high school kids every day of you know you have to take all the ap classes you have to get a 4.0 in high school you have to well, you know, think, get a 1700 on your sats or you're not going to college and that's just absolutely ridiculous it's definitely not true especially to a lot of the people i know who go to high schools where you can even get a 1700 on the sat like where the quality of education is such that more than one student is going to achieve that score well it's you know not what i'm a, saying it's not a possible score whatever well i guess it is it is now because they take into account all three scores now right but so a 20 whatever, a like, 2700 or whatever i think it's aren't they all 800 points 2400 it's 2400 is the max i was i was trying to go one step above the max is what i was getting at with this well what, I, what i'm trying to say is like if you go to a school where there are multiple students getting like a 2400 or whatever or an amazing score on the sat the fact that you went to that school is probably going to carry you to college anyway right it's like i got an incredible score on my sat i'm not gonna lie to you i did very very well on the sat and the act how'd you do the sat on the sat yeah i had like a out of 16, I had like a f- No, uh Yeah. Oh, wow. You're way better than me. Yeah. No, I did better than most people. I did and that was like a very good score it was yeah like yeah. i remember going to my music audition and uh dr reimer who you know yeah uh was like how did you get into this school based on my gpa and i was like i did really good on my sats and he looked at me and he was like oh yep there it is yep that's it oh yeah and absolutely that that was the reason that i because the gpa i applied with was the GPA, a lot lower than gpa i graduated with because i took all my ap classes senior year all my like weighted classes right um so i definitely got into college based on my sat but it's like i got into i applied to pretty much every school in virginia and got into almost all of them i got into every 
everywhere I applied except one. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I got turned down by one school. And I mean, I was getting letters from schools, like local, very good private schools that a lot of a lot of people I know who go into the medical field or, you know, went to. Right. Or law or stuff like that. And like, I wouldn't even apply. And they would be like, hey, you're accepted. Here's a scholarship. If you'd like to go yeah. here, just let us know. And I am 100% acknowledging that I that we were very privileged with the public school system where we grew up. Yeah, we definitely were. Like, oh my God. Especially compared to where we went to college. Oh, yeah. That Big have... That, it's not like oh, we're worried about this many people getting into college. It's like they have a 50% graduation rate. Right. We had a 96% college rate. Right. Like the people that didn't go to college went in the military. That was it. Went into the military or there was a few That went to like a jobs. trade school. Yeah. Military. I don't think there was much trade school, but there was like firefighters. Yeah. Well, Joe it Carpenter like public went service. to trade school. Joe Carpenter. I remember that for some reason. Yeah, he went to like I, mechanic school. He's a dude that looks like Toby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, he went to mechanic school. And you know what? He's probably making more money than me. You are unemployed. He was probably making more money than me before I quit my job. <laughs> because mechanics, like actual mechanics that have their own garages and whatever, make bank. And the ASE certification. Yeah. First of all, advice number one, children, don't let anybody tell you that trades are bad. Plumbers make a lot of money. Also, don't just do it for the pursuit of money. Do, do like, pursue what you want to pursue. And if what you want to pursue is money, that's fine. Right. But if you want to own your own business, work with your hands and do something, like, by all means, go for it. Right. I'm not There's... sitting here. I, I don't subscribe to the notion that everybody who graduates high school has to go to college or they're doomed or they're not going to succeed is the yeah is, the, doomed. is like the mentality yeah doomed <laughs> and it's yeah it's a it's amazing how it was bad when we went to college first went to college and graduated and it's gotten even worse well one of the things i love about this movie just to draw, bring it back to that is that one of the first like the establishing scene with mr keating is when he takes them out into the hallway and he says listen i know you're feeling all this immense ridiculous pressure from your parents from everybody who's looking at you but at the end of the day we're all gonna die and he's not like approaching it from a realist perspective but he's approaching it in such a way that's like yeah first day of class there's no reason not to live and enjoy the time you spend on this earth and the boys you're looking at from 1902 are now dead, but they were just as pressured as you are. They had, you know, just as high of expectations to go to college. And I think that that's so important that you see that from 1902 to 1969 to now seeing it in 2018, where when you talk to these high schoolers, it's like, if I don't take six AP courses, I'm never going to make it. Right. It's only gotten, and, and as the as the privilege across America has increased, it, it has gotten worse and worse and worse because more people are able to afford college, to go to college, to have the schools, to get them into college. It's, it's not like you don't have to go to prep school anymore more right you can you can go to private school you can go to prep school but like you that that was the only way some of those kids were going to college because you know from the mining towns they're from right you know there, there weren't schools but now it's like yeah you can get aside from some places obviously you can get a decent education most places yeah decent enough that there are people going to college from everywhere i mean yeah it's definitely more of a struggle for almost everyone than it was for us so i have a, a question for you ethan yep um what lesson from mr keating do you think has been the most important in your life either applicable in high school a time that you thought about this film or that you took away from this most recent viewing and in high school did you have a teacher or in college did you have a teacher that had this kind of impact on you and then i'll follow it up with the third question so there are two kind of lessons that that i always take away from this movie that are on two ends of the spectrum one is about life and one is sort of about enjoyment like i always take away the lesson obviously the, the carpe diem lessons always been very important to me that you just kind of got to take life by the horns mm -hmm. and and go with what happens to you that there really isn't a reason not to enjoy life that you, you, you're not put on this earth to you know be an accountant for 40 years and die you are if you love numbers i mean yeah that's fine i'm just i'm picking a job that like generally you're gonna seek satisfaction outside of the workplace right but there's no reason you need to seek satisfaction when you're not at work like there's no reason to not seek satisfaction at work right that's what i'm saying is like you 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 were put on this earth to do more than just be a job and make money for somebody else and die right and on the other end of that i think that that first lesson he teaches them when he tells them to rip everything out of the book that like enjoy art however the you want yeah that's a very important and lesson. it's a lesson he teaches them over and over again with the, the thing where they're walking around the courtyard where they have to make their own poetry yeah over and over again that just like this the, people created this art for you to enjoy however you want and a lot of times that's not noticed as much with literature as it is with other forms of art a lot of times with literature there's a like this is how you're supposed to to see things. I remember that very much frustrating me in high school was especially in, in my ninth grade English course was like we would read you know Romeo and Juliet or uh, we'll, we'll run out that one and I couldn't quite piece together the difference between my teacher explaining to me what wherefore art thou Romeo meant in modern English and what it meant like like she would tell me that means why is your name Romeo Montague 
right? Yeah. Uh, I was making sure I got the last names right. And, like, that's fine. Like, that's <coughs> factual and correct. But then, you know, the follow-up to that is the, like, allegorical meaning to it or the significant meaning to it that, like, we've ascribed over so many years and, you know, been passed from English teacher to English teacher, but, it like, it, it hasn't. I remember getting frustrated because I would interpret things in my own way and the teacher wouldn't, like, allow me to. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I know exactly what you're talking about. And... And I remember getting frustrated by that. And I don't even think the teacher necessarily like, like there were definitely teachers that wanted it their way or the highway. And, and I get that. And those teachers do exist. But now that I'm an adult and I know a lot of people who are teachers, I know that most of them teach because they enjoy... The, they, the reason they got into teaching was because they wanted the discourse with students of a proper reading level to discuss different potential meanings for this thing. But when none of the students even get the first part, it's hard for them to get the second part. Right. And that's why a lot of people get burnt out teaching. Yeah, I could see that, definitely. And I think... To, for me, a lot of the teachers that have influenced me in, in high school and college and even before were the ones that kind of did break from that mold that weren't the traditional teachers that you think about. The, the ones that asked that that asked more questions than they told answers to. That, that were a lot like John Keating in the in the sense that like it didn't matter what the necessarily to them what the curriculum said. It's like we're going to learn how we learn. Yes. And that's what Keating taught was that, you know, it's not about learning specific prose. It's about learning how to learn and how to live. Right. And I've had a lot of great teachers that were that were by the book teachers that taught you everything you needed to know about whatever and i've had a lot of great teachers that that took it the other direction and we're just like you know if you don't get it let me help you get it it's not about what william shakespeare wanted you to learn it's about what you learned from it right very well said i remember you and i had a class together with a teacher that i thought did an excellent excellent job of this um it was our 11th grade u.s history course pete lustig pete lustig i remember very vividly yeah pete lustig explaining bias in media by showing us a story from one news agency about an immigrant family who or like an, an illegal immigrant family who had a restaurant who gave back to their community who you know, did all of these amazing wonderful things and then he showed us another story from a different news organization about an immigrant family that came to america and they were criminals they you know stole cars and and did all of these terrible things and and i don't remember the news outlets i'm not trying to call anybody out on this um and it was it was such an effective lesson in like consider your source yeah well consider your source and and let the text speak differently to everyone right and i lucy was very good at that and i've had several teachers that were very good at that i had, I had a bunch in high school um, in high school, for whatever reason, I got put on the, like, not, there were a bunch of different tiers for classes that we had. It's like, I wasn't in pre-AP and then AP English. I was in the, like, college-bound English. I had excellent college For all four courses. years, and those were by far, like, some of my favorite teachers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my first three English teachers in high school were incredible. Yeah, I learned, I learned more from, about how to be a person, how to do literature, and how to learn things from Matthew Neal and, 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 uh, Peter Matheson than I did from anybody else in school. Yeah. And they were, they I, were, they were seen as, like, the dumb teachers that taught the dumb kids. And I ended up in those classes somehow. I think it was something about work ethic, doesn't complete homework, <laughs> doesn't do I, his essays on time, but they're very good. Yeah, I remember asking Peter Matheson if he, because I noticed I would get a paperback and understand 17 year olds are rather judgmental at least I was and I would see another student who I knew shouldn't have done better than me on an assignment get a better score and so I asked Matheson I, I mean I got an A in the class in the end but I would get a 95 they would get a 100 you know what I'm saying yeah and I would I asked Matheson one day and I was like do you grade my assignments harder because you know I'm smarter and he was like yeah yeah absolutely he told me the same yeah, thing a hundred percent yeah he was like he, he said that straight up he was like I grade to the student he didn't last all that long as a teacher uh, most of the good ones generally don't from what I've seen yeah it's the ones, the ones that last in teaching are the ones that, that are very by the book. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's just... Well, there's definitely something wrong with the standards of learning and the way we test students. I mean, you wouldn't say there's a problem with the Virginia SOLs. I would definitely say there is. Here's the problem, <laughs> is that I think, I think schools teach the correct four subjects. I really do. I think math, science, English, and history are the important four things to learn yeah. from it, it gives you seven, a, It gives you a good base from, for everything else because right. if you don't understand how the world works, you're going to have a hard time understanding Byron and Thoreau. Right. And you're also going to have a hard time writing like Byron and Thoreau. Yeah. It's like you, they, they, they were all of the great authors of all time have been very intelligent people across the board. Right. Like look at, uh, you know, the, the concept of being a Renaissance man. You look at Da Vinci who could invent and write and paint and do everything. Right. It's, you know, it's, it's just a matter of, of doing everything and learning everything. And and the reason I think those four subjects are so important, and they've introduced like a personal finance requirement 
Is that correct? Yeah, that so that that was like two years after us. Like the class above us had to take keyboarding, and we didn't, and we also didn't have to take personal finance. Right, but the class below us did. Yeah, yeah. I never took either one, but I took keyboarding. I always see the argument for why don't they teach how to do taxes in school, and I hate that argument. Okay, do you want to know how to do taxes? Literally, Google. How it's to file really my taxes. not that hard. It's it's not that hard at all. Google how to file your taxes in Virginia. What they should be teaching in schools, and what they are teaching in schools, is how to be an effective human being. How to feel empathy how to feel right uh, how to i remember very vividly i once was in driver improvement program which is like a class you go to if you're a probably privileged person and you get a speeding ticket instead of paying for the ticket but anyway i had to go to the driver improvement course and i remember this cop standing in front of the class and having no understanding of 11th grade physics and being afraid to speak up because i did understand 11th grade physics or 12th grade physics yeah because i remember the cop saying we see this all the time where there will be skid marks for 200 feet and that means that the car was was only going 20 miles an hour and i remember having just learned how to do that problem in physics and if there was i don't remember the numbers and i don't remember how to do it and and i want to tell high schoolers that if you know these things it is important that you know them and it is okay to share them yeah. but i remember like doing the math prop doing the physics problem based on the information he'd given us and i came to the conclusion that like if you see skid marks for 200 feet that means the car couldn't have been going anything short of 140 miles an hour right you know it's like if you see that and i think those may be skewed numbers i'm sure somebody's going to write in but like they just knowing these things is important. You're not going to be an effective cop if you don't know how basic physics works. Yeah. Well, there was a, not- I, I took a drive improvement program one time, and there was a guy in there that with me that uh, got out of a ticket by proving that he was not the cause of an accident by doing physics. I believe it. Yeah. And the cops were just like, okay, cool. Listen, I appreciate our police officers, and I appreciate what they do. I do think it's a little weird that you have to get a law degree to be a lawyer. But you have to go to like a, depending upon the principality, like a six week to two year program to be a cop. Anyway, Dead Poets Society. <laughs> um, we have not talked about this movie hardly at all. We And I knew this was going to be a thing. This, is, this wasn't ever going to be a super funny episode, like laugh out loud funny. We're obviously going to try to bring bits of humor into it here and there, but this is a serious movie. It is one of Robin Williams' least funny roles, in my opinion. He is he is funny in it, though. He is funny in it, but it's like compared to some of his other roles, I'm not going to say it's his least funny. I mean, there's there's movies out there like The Fisher King, which are very sad. Bicentennial Man. Yeah. And, and Flubber. And, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, <laughs> Flubber was supposed to be funny. <laughs> I'm sure. It, I haven't seen it since I was I a child. I thought it was child. hilarious. <laughs> thought it was hilarious then. I'm sure I, it's not now. But um, this isn't the genie. Yeah, no. It, this movie was never intended to be a laugh out loud hilarious movie. It is. It is tragic. It does, however, I would say have a happy ending sort for of. these kids. I mean, Neil's dead. Neil's dead, but I think to Neil that means he's better off. Yeah, Neil would rather die than do what he's being forced to do. Right. And, I, and and that's just where you got to take movie things with a grain of salt sometimes is because, like, no, I don't think your dad telling you that you can't do theater is a good reason to kill yourself, but I'm not going to, like, discount anybody's struggle. But it's like you have to take it, the, the fact that these people are just archetypes. They are metaphors. Yes. Neil also didn't talk to his dad, right? Right, like, definitely have the conversation. He tried at the end there, and the dad's just kind of like, I don't care what you what you feel. It's like, it's about me and what I want you to do. Right. And there, there are parents that act like that, but most parents are not like that. Definitely not these days. Like, I feel like millennial parents are not like that. For the most part. I'm sure there, there are some people there. are there definitely those cases. And I, like, like, and I remember even myself feeling like this weird pressure not to go to college and study music. Even though my parents, like, went with me to auditions and supported me in so many different ways. I, I still, like in my mind felt like I'm a disappointment to them because I'm doing this. Yeah, I mean, I felt the same thing. It's like my granddad was an engineer. He went to engineering school. And I knew that there was some part of my dad that wanted me to be like him. Right. And I just wasn't going to do that. Just wasn't in the cards. <laughs> didn't want to be an engineer. I could have. I didn't really want to. I didn't want to be an accountant. I think I would have been good at it. My other granddad was an accountant. Yeah? Yeah, but I'm he wasn't particularly accountant. like, hey, you should be an accountant. Well, Ethan, you should. Have you reconsidered? No, not particularly. <laughs> You just let me know. I know some people. Okay. I'll give you a call if I need need that accounting hookup. Can do. Okay, perfect. Anyway, uh, yeah, I definitely felt some pressure to be like the older members of my family and, and kind of do those things. But I never felt like my parents weren't going to love me for my choices. And maybe that's me being very, very blessed. I know that my parents have been extra supportive and I and I can't fault that by any means. Like, I, I you know, I, I'm not fault. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I can't discount that fact. It's like I have been very supported, but I know other people aren't. But I feel like, yeah, the, for the most part, parents don't generally drive their kids to these points these days you know what i'm saying that was really convoluted and i don't know if i made a whole lot of sense 
but no it makes sense and it definitely uh it's it's a tough conversation because you and i feel like we're very blessed growing up and very fortunate in our situations and you know there are definitely kids out there who feel this pressure and and suffer the same neil same fate as neil oh for sure and, it happens uh, every day and it's a tragedy yeah it absolutely but is. go ahead I mean, it's, it's total tragedy um does this make you want to learn more yeah definitely every time i watch are this you... movie i'm like man i just don't like i don't take away everything i should every time i read a book now i i agree with that i definitely agree with that let's let's do some quick not necessarily a hard critique but i want to point out some things that i i really enjoyed and i think elevate this film from a filmmaking perspective okay now there's one shot in particular early on in the film where it Every time the bell chimes, it shows more birds getting up and flying. Yeah. And it's a bunch of different shots. I love the continuity with that to where it comes back to it later in the film. and Where Neil rides the bike through the birds? It's not Neil, it's Knox. Is it Knox? Yeah, Knox. It's Knox. This is going to the other school. Where he, it's like after they've learned the lesson and he rides his bike and rings the bell and it goes and he goes through the birds. And I think that that's like such an important turning point. I thought where it was it's Neil. Like, is it not Neil? It's definitely Knox because he's going to the other school. It's Neil when he's going to tryouts. I thought it was Knox going to the prep school because the scene immediately following that is Knox on a bike at a tailgate. I'm pretty sure. Hold on. I got to look this up because I, th I thought it was Neil deciding he was going to go to tryouts. Hold on. I'm looking at it. No, right you're now. right. It is Knox. Yeah. It is Knox. He's the one that falls in love with Chris for those yeah. trying to keep track of the characters. Uh, and I think that's such an important scene. It shows the shift that, like, this school went from a pillar of making the birds fly. You know, it's, it's a very poetic thing, the flight of birds. It's it's a simple thing that can be poetic. That's sort of what the, the movie's about. Uh, and it goes from, like, the school being what causes that and what makes such an impact on the world to one person can have that impact, can have that ripple effect that causes right. the birds that to causes fly. The birds that causes the birds to fly. Um, Man, I never thought uh, of that like that. That's, dang. It's so good. That's a really good scene. Yeah, I know it is. It's, like, one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie. Yeah. Is there any other filmmaking aspects of the film that you really, really liked? Any Anything in particular that stood out to you? Yeah. I mean, this this movie, at a time when movies weren't really particularly well shot, where, like, mm -hmm. the, the movies cinema as a whole didn't focus on on the filmmaking this is an Con incredibly well shot movie there's a really simple one towards the end that i think is a, a an important one to notice if you're newer to sort of studying film and i don't think you are but ye listener maybe um what happens is at the end when Neil walks through his parents' house, every shot is from behind him. Yeah. And then when his dad walks through the house, every shot is reversed. Yep. It's all in, it's front right of him. in front of him. Well, that and the scene of of Todd in the snow when he's distraught by by the break break that one down for me. What? Because that was a scene that I watched and I was like, I know this is important, but I can't place my finger on why. Like I can't quite get the meaning figured out. So what what did you perceive as a part of that? Was was the message from that scene? Well, it's it's just about like. I, I, I took it as him being kind of cleansed of the memory, not of the memory, but being cleansed of the grief. Mm hmm of everything is like yeah he's broken because he finally opened up to somebody he finally made a friend mm -hmm. he found somebody important in his life and that person's gone now like completely gone Neil's dead right. there's no way and and originally that scene was actually supposed to take place just like in the in the hallway of their dorm room right it was, a, it was instead yeah it was a last minute change um I guess it had started snowing outside and the director was just kind of like okay we're gonna go do this in the snow uh let's, put, let's put your jackets it. on boys it it's a Aussie director is that correct uh, yeah, Peter Weir, I think, is his name. I don't know much about this guy. I don't either. I, I had no idea. I don't know this this name very much. He directed The Truman Show. He directed Master and Commander. These are all very good movies. I think what's interesting about the scene where they're all going out into the snow is it also echoes earlier in the film. Um, they are constantly getting in and out of step with each other. It's very brief. Yeah, all the time. Um, yeah, really any scene of them all walking, it like improves throughout the movie how not in step they are. Well, because they're... At the beginning, they're they're just this group of miscreants. You know, they they you they show the school and everything the school's about. You know, they have back in whatever year we had five graduates and now we have fifty one. And what are the four pillars? You've you've been asked every class has been asked the same question. And then you take them back to the dorm room and they they repeat the thing about what are the four pillars that they have their own four pillars and they're obviously just troublemakers. Right. They're the seedy underbelly of the school, for lack of a better word. I mean, they're they're just to show that teenagers will go against any kind of authority, no matter right. what. And then and at that point they're all very in step. They're all the same person. They're they're just they're one multi-headed 
beast of rebellion. And as that goes on, they all find their individual identities. They become themselves because of this professor. Right. And they all, you know, they become the guy who falls in love or the guy who discovers that he... Is he is he gay? Does he identify as a woman? How does the Lawanda thing work? Lawanda? Char- Charlie? Yeah, yeah. Charlie is just... I don't think he identifies as a woman necessarily. I mean, he, it might be. And if, and if the that sect of people wants to take this as like an anthem for them, go for it because that's there's obviously those illusions you can draw to it. But Charlie just doesn't want to be the norm charlie doesn't want to be charlie yeah he doesn't want to be charlie it's all he's worried about is he because even uh, neil says it that he's like you know we're not rich like charlie's family right so charlie's dealing with his own pressure to be charlie now i want to ask you on the flip side of things you know that the movie keating doesn't teach realism you know that's an important important part of the he doesn't teach the realists no um and sort of piggybacking on that point what do you think of the four pillars of the school of the actual four pillars right what tradition honor discipline excellence two of them are very important and two of them are just absolute I'm curious what you think is which. So excellence is undermined literally in a scene 10 minutes later when they're talking about you can't rate a poem's greatness. Correct. Excellence, yeah, they're excellence about. isn't. So yeah, excellence is a goal you can strive for. And people always say that it's like one of those grand motto things. Like, strive for excellence. Right. But what does that mean? It's not a word. I mean, it is a word, but it's, it's not a concept. It's not something you can you can reach. It's not attainable. You can't touch it. It doesn't have a like a measure. It's not like, oh, oh this this deed you did got you 14 standard excellence units. Right. And then discipline is the literal horse. You don't think it's important to be disciplined? No, I don't think that the, the school doesn't care about being disciplined. The school cares about discipline. Right. Yeah, they care about paddling. Yeah. Uh, punishment. They care about not stepping a toe out of the line. Even the, you, so, even the teacher that's like, because you got the, uh, whatever his name is, I don't know, the guy that has the accent, that's like not really the the bad guy teacher, but is kind of the, the guy that's like, Keating, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're hurting them by telling them to be their own person. Yeah, 17 year olds can't think for themselves. Right. That guy, even that guy is just so stuck in this mentality of like we're gonna be who we're supposed to be see i think i think you've got it a little bit wrong i think keating's whole thing is that he teaches these four things in a way that the school has misinterpreted them so the school sees excellence as like financial wealth and oh for sure that and that's what i'm saying but i can get behind tradition and honor well i can too however you want to however you want to paint them it's like i don't think there's a i don't think there's a bad way to have honor and i there's usually not a bad way to have tradition now doing a bad thing because that's the way we've always done it around here is a bad thing but correct and i think that's sort of what keating's that's definitely what he's getting at is that and that's that's the problem i have with teaching is that it's just still being done the way we've always done it around here correct well and i mean if you ever talk to a teacher they don't like the way that it's done right and and specifically about things that are open to more interpretation like english correct like i'm not super worried about authorial intent in physics like i think sir isaac newton probably had our best interest at heart <laughs> but he may that have stuff's a little bit more black and white it's like you can argue it all you want but it's just kind of going to keep happening whether you want it to or not right gravity's going to keep happening <laughs> right gravity's always there but yeah especially with 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 english with literature and 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 specifically poetry well and i think yeah they had to choose poetry especially for this film you know, it's called dead poet society but they could have chosen poetry is quick and audible which is what made it an excellent tool for this film it is also um, the most ignored and made fun of thing in in modern teaching oh yeah i even even in high school I was like i don't want to read poetry make it man reading poetry makes me a <laughs> very uh very worldly back in 2080 i mean maybe not in high school but there was definitely a time where i thought like that where i was like poetry's for girls yeah and and i mean obviously we've grown up from that point and i think society has a little bit as well it definitely has uh, and, and i still don't get poetry the way i'm supposed to like there is a big I, I i get a lot of literature i read a lot of books and and there's still just a huge gap in my ability to talk about and understand things and it's it is shaped a lot like poetry i think the key is like most things you just have to keep doing it until you start figuring it out right and i think you can do it the was it thatcher is that who they read who who's the phd j evans pritchard pritchard that's what it is um that's like a real thing right yeah the i think so the pritchard I think scale that's a real book yeah pritchard scale for poetry yeah Yikes. i think you can do it that way and i almost think that's a decent way to start it especially if you don't have an excellent teacher um i think this also speaks volumes for the value of an excellent teacher so many people these days say they want to learn how to do things on their own and that's how i go back to the learn to do your own taxes thing it's like you can figure out doing your own taxes it's going to be hard to learn how to be in an orchestra by yourself yeah and and a lot of things just make it a lot more understandable if you can bounce ideas off people right exactly um, sorry I'm not super hilarious tonight. I'm having fun with this, though. I know, this I is... am too. This is a very, like I said, it's a very, very important movie. It's just, 
it's not funny. I mean, it made me laugh occasionally, but like, it's not. There's nothing funny about the miseducation of America's youth. Correct. But I think we could we could stand to probably talk about the movie a little bit as well. Um, as what do you mean? as a movie, we talked a lot about like ethos and teaching. And I think we could probably also stand to talk a little bit about the movie as a movie. And we kind of got there with the, the cinematography thing we were talking about. But I think there's there's we can talk about the characters a little bit. We can delve into some of the, the, the better plot points. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what. Before we get into that, I do want to announce we have a brand new $1 a month Patreon tier available forever. But limited time till we run out, we got in the mail these amazing bacon and eggs postcards. And me and Ethan are writing personalized letters to everyone who becomes a new patron until we run out of these things at any Patreon level. So if you want to do the dollar amount, that's fine. If you want to do $5 and join us on Discord, that's great. If you want to do $10 and watch a movie with us in the middle of the month, that would be awesome. I think we're watching another literature movie, which would be really fun. We are? We talked about Stranger Than Fiction. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, right? Such an important oh, movie man, for people I to see. I love that movie. It's so good. Uh, if you want to join our Google Hangouts at $50 a month, you can do whatever you want. But as long as you sign up to join our Patreon this month, the month of September... You're not even going to be charged until October 1st. We will write you a custom personalized letter on a very nice high quality cardstock um, bacon and eggs postcard. They're they're really, really nice looking. And we may throw in a little surprise present with it as well. We also may not. I'm not making any guarantees there. Um, but we've got a few bacon and eggs pieces of, of merchandise and memorabilia that we may just throw in with a few of these. Uh, but please, if you'd love to support the show, if you like the show, if you like what we do, we're, we're literally only asking for a dollar right now. Our next goal on Patreon is to have a certain number of patrons and not a certain dollar amount and we just want to grow this community so if you'd like to join us on patreon please do patreon.com slash bacon and eggs we're having a lot of fun with it well while we're at things that aren't dead post society tyler d got any hash browns for me Ethan, i want to talk about your hash browns um you charged me to read or to watch westworld the pilot the pilot yeah the the first episode i think it was... i want to know if you have any like prompting questions for me so i guess the main the main question is did you kind of get it and what are your takeaways i figured it out immediately okay like before they had revealed what was going on i was like this is a simulation this is not all set in the west in the old west that's not what you're supposed uh, to get. You're supposed I mean, to got, know that immediately. Okay, well, I got that part. Okay, that was, that was like, I'm pretty sure that's that's said in the episode description. Like, Oh, I didn't read the episode description. But they, within the first five minutes, when, when Teddy doesn't die. Yeah, yeah, that was... It was pretty obvious. Yeah, okay. So that's not necessarily what you're supposed to get out of it. Um, I think the the man in black, that's what he's going to be called, right? Mm-hmm. There we go. Yeah. J.J. Abrams. Uh, I, <laughs> I literally, I've watched the first episode and I went into the room where my girlfriend was studying. And I was like, man, this is real J.J. Abrams. Yeah, there's a man in black. Uh, I think that dude's going to be the like, you know, long-term antagonist. He's going to break out of the simulation or he's he's a not a part of it or is a part of it or he's already broken out. There's something about him that doesn't quite okay. work. Okay, interesting. I figured figured that much out i thought as far as uh the the way it was shot and acted was excellent the the story was very interesting it's a little bit 21st century sort of like evil realism oh definitely for me and i i'm kind of over that sort of like philosophy fair oh. enough I, I can understand that it, it, uh, it definitely starts to get away from that i mean i'm sure it does it looked very very good uh it becomes, it's definitely better than the other television i've yeah, been watching it, recently over time it becomes a lot more like bradbury and a lot less, you know, just regular dystopia. Right. Um, I thought the casting was all very, very well. Uh, I, I'm not a, like, I don't dislike it in any way. I don't think that the nudity was necessary. Yeah, I agree with that. But that's HBO. Like, right. I was just kind of like, why did you have to take their clothes off to sit them down to ask them a question? You know, I, I'm consistently, and the, and the show asked the, the, uh, that question as well several times yeah it just in like a, later on in, in a very much like the showrunners told us we had to do that and the writers are like why right it, it, so that was kind of a weird thing for me i thought how they did the like orchestral paint it black at the the shootout at the el royale or whatever yeah i thought that was really cool yeah there's a lot of cool little nods there well so 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 you enjoyed i did enjoy Good. it i very I, I thought it was very i'd give it a one i think you know people should, should at least check this show out yeah it's not gonna be for everybody i mean no hbo shows are for everybody that's kind of yeah, what i love about I, some of these non-network televisions these days is like it doesn't have to be for everybody anymore yes and the um, same thing with I mean, netflix yeah, and the prime was, originals and everything like that it's like they're orange of the new black is also definitely not for everybody man that's a show at least as much of it as i've seen oh. uh but yeah i really liked it i appreciate you recommending it is there any like questions you have for me like no not really maybe if you continue to watch going forward i would i would be interested in having a conversation but it, it's the the first episode is i think a one of the best pilots i've seen in a long time and that's kind of why i wanted to watch wanted you to watch it because i think it did a, yeah, i like it did a very good job of setting up a show i really liked the 
the way that the pilot worked. I really liked how it set up the show, and then right at the end, it brings back the fly, which I'm sure is going to be like the you know quote unquote bug in the system, and it's going to. So you caught that part? Oh, yeah, yeah. Where she kills the fly? Yeah, yeah okay. and nobody else t- can even touch the flies. Right. I think she'll probably break out as well, or there will be some sort of uprising in the command center. Um, I don't know, something like that is what I foresee for that Fair show. Enough. It is, Am I, like, way off? No, no, not really. Um, yes and no. It's not going to be in the way you think it is. It isn't Jurassic Park. Okay, because like, it, it is Crichton. It is Crichton, and it feels very Jurassic Park, especially in the early episodes, but it doesn't follow the same plot line. The one thing that, I, I don't know if this was said and I just wasn't paying attention, but the one thing that sort of messed me up was, like, the sort of nowhere where the factory is or whatever, the command center. Where is that supposed to be? It's just up on that ridge. Okay, so it's near the town. Yeah. And the town isn't, like, something... It's not like the Matrix that you get into. It's, it's like, a real place you could, like, walk to. Yeah, it's in a wrong? big, it's in a big like, valley. The okay. whole the whole map is in a big valley. But it is, like, real. Yeah, but it's completely cut off. Right, 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 right. Yeah. But, like, if you did get in a car you are, and drive You are to still in physical space, yes. Okay. Like, you take... You go to the command center, you take the train into Sweetwater. Is that what it's called? That's the town, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you take you take the train into Sweetwater. It, just, it is a real place. Like, they, they go there from the command center. I think the skinny programmer dude's gonna die. The, the, um... The, the British The guy. script guy? Yeah. yeah. No. That dude's gonna die. I don't know. He has not yet? I can't remember. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've only seen the first season. Um, okay. Fair enough. Well, that, so, I... That was my immediate prediction. I watched, or I, I read, uh, the first issue, the only issue, of West Coast Avengers. What'd you think? That was awesome. Wasn't it so yeah, good? Yeah, it's like, it, at first I thought it was just gonna be really campy, because there's this whole thing with the land sharks i thought they were hilarious and like like guy and girl hawkeye and i was like okay here we go i was like this is just gonna be ridiculous but it did a very good job of introducing me to a set of characters that i immediately care about without just hinging it on other characters it's like yeah you've got that one bridging guy there yeah in hawkeye but it's it they're they're all very good characters and you had your deadpool moments the 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 one part i thought was funny from deadpool 2 was replicated in this comic with the with her interviewing all the different um yeah where she's interviewing the different uh like applicants right and she she interviews gwenpool yeah (laughs) and i was like okay so wait he has a deadpool as a spider gwen now like oh yeah i didn't know that um so that was pretty funny it was it was funny it was cheeky and it's very like and you didn't need much context no none none at all it's a whole new story and i like that it was a lot of fun i really enjoyed the way it was um drawn it's it just like it still feels retro but also very very modern yeah and i also enjoyed but it wasn't i also enjoyed the experience of, of looking at it on my phone for the first time Ever, because I've taken a couple stabs at like this these digital comic things, mm-hmm. and I read this on my phone, and I thought the interface was actually pretty seamless. I don't know if it was designed to work with the interface or not, but it was it it felt very good to actually read it, which was very interesting. Now, did you do the thing? The one thing I did, I read it. I own the book, so I read it out of the page. Um, did you do the thing on your phone where you like kind of double tap and then it'll give you like one frame at a time? Yes. Okay, that is the best way to read a comic. Book. Yes, absolutely. That's the only way I can. I I've, I immediately was like, wow, this is so much better than trying to read a comic book yeah, just for me because i'm page... sitting there like you guys can't see me but i'm just looking all over the place because that's what i do every right. time i get a comic book i open it up i'm like where do i start obviously right. top left but like sometimes it's not even top left right or sometimes what gets me is that like you turn a page and there's not much happening on your page but on the next page is like a giant image right and and, and it's like you try to you, how you am try i to not look past look it and so, but yeah this gives you like one cell at a time yeah it works really really well with classic comics where they could only write in cells um yeah and and, and I, I figured that might be the case um i had a back because i read some of the walking dead comics before i got incredibly bored of them because they diverge from the show almost instantly mm-hmm. and it's just completely different um but it, it, and i had some like digital comic book reader on my computer that was just awful i'm sure and it would try to do the same thing where it like showed you a cell at a time but it, like they weren't optimized for it mm. at all and all it really did was zoom in on stuff so it was just these like awkward weird things but you know the interface itself of reading it was actually very good i'm very interested to continue with the series when how often do they come out i i have no idea fair enough uh, i wasn't sure if you like knew like oh it's every fortnight or every month or every i imagine they're monthly i think most comics are monthly okay but yeah, I'm it was like it was it, a but... it was a series I could get into without having any kind of context, nothing else to worry about, and something I could start from the first issue and read like at a reasonable pace. Yeah, and it it, it was it was good. It was yeah, it was just very good. It was very very well written. It was funny, but like not over the top. I liked that like they introduced a character and they were like these are her powers or her, his powers. Oh, every time yeah, the little uh, the little things that are just like it's got the powers and then like some quip. It was very Scott Pilgrim. Yeah, have you read those? I have not. Oh man. That is not my hash brown, but you should. Okay. 
I, I I will. I will. So what am I to be reading next week or doing? Say that again. What is, what what hash browns do you have for me oh, for next okay. week? Okay. So I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a musical hash brown this week. I've got one for you too. Oh, that's so weird. I don't so I don't I think we're going to have a little bit of a problem with this and you can tell me if I need to pick something different because I don't think mine is going to be available for like purchase on Amazon. Okay. So if that's going to bother you then I can pick something else. I mean, that's fine. Okay. So I've I've got I think it's six songs. Uh it is it is an extended play by a band that I play with pretty frequently called Keep Flying and it's called Walkabout. Okay. It's about John Locke. It is about John Locke. Yeah. How'd it feel? Man in black. Yeah. It was bringing uh, it all back to that. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. It's. It's. It's a vaguely lost based uh, ska record. Ooh, I like ska records. I, I figured. I was like, hey, how can I? How can I get tie into into some of the bands that I kind of really like, but are kind of off color? And there's nothing well, inappropriate will... about this band, but it, it, they are. They're very good. They're very nice people. They put on a heck heck of a show, and uh, it, they make very good music. That's sort of about lost. Interesting. And it's I'm called Walk About excited. by Q Flying. I'm excited to look into this. What um, What is your hash brown? So this is something I. I imagine you may have visited at some point. Okay. Um, but I, I don't think you visited it recently. So I'm gonna assign it, and I don't know if you've ever uh, visited it in its entirety. Okay. If that makes sense. <laughs> so I'm waiting so, with bated breath. It's, I mean, it's nothing like crazy, but I want you to listen to. Bo Burnham's self-titled album. Okay. I have not ventured into that much at all. It's from 2009. Bo Burnham's self-titled album. Okay, I'm on Spotify. So just Bo Burnham, him at the tiny piano. Yep. I've definitely yep, yep. seen this album before. I've just never listened to it. Yeah, and, and there's like... I listened to it the other day. I think this is... I listened to all of his albums the other day, and I think this one is his best one. Fair enough. Musical comedy is always one of those things where I'm, like, afraid to be into it. I am too, but I just want to let you know Tenacious D announced a new rock opera today. And I'm sure it'll and be awesome. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. I'm but so it's excited. But like, it's one of those things that I, 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 and I guess I had some experience with this where, I, and I don't even remember what it was, where I was like, yo, you should check out this by this, and that somebody was like, wow, you listen to musical comedy, you're really lame. I think I've brought this point up on the podcast before, and that I am, like, a musical comedy apologist. You definitely have. Have. Yeah, about Tenacious D, but I'm just letting you know that I also struggle with that, and it's something I wish I didn't. So I'm I'm, I'm very happy to dive into this to this Bo Burnham. I just downloaded it on Spotify, so I will definitely check it out over the course of the next week, and I will report back with pleasure. It is super inappropriate, so just gonna... I believe it. <laughs> okay, one of these songs is called Clan Cookout. <laughs> I have yet to enjoy, and, and maybe this is just me being, like, a profane and inappropriate person, but I generally enjoy stand-up comics more when they are completely inappropriate. Oh, I do too. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not gonna, fan. I'm not gonna shy away from that. It's like, that's, that's one realm of entertainment where I'm like, it's generally better when it's not family-friendly. Well, but I also like, uh, Brian Regan. I haven't really listened to much of him. He's very good. He's a comedian. Family-friendly. Well, I think he does some non-family-friendly stuff, but when he comes to Roanoke, he does family-friendly show. I think that is funny. the case, is that he does both. Yeah. Th- that being said, there are plenty of family-friendly comedians I've never gotten into. Like, I never liked Louis C.K. That guy is not family friendly. I said not family friendly. Oh, oh. It's, I'm not. You said I'm saying right. not every family, every not every non family friendly comedian is funny just because they say the heck words. Tell jokes. Yeah. yeah, the heck words. Uh, like Louis C.K. is. I've never found Louis C.K. funny, no, even before that he had all the issues. No, I think apathetic humor, apathetic observational humor, isn't funny. It's sad. Yeah, I agree with that. I did, however, I liked him on Parks and Rec. Yeah, I love as, everyone as on Dave Rec. the awkward cop. Yeah. Um, but I would say my favorite comedian is Hannibal Buress, or he was probably until he was in Spider Man, and then he kind of got a little weird. Hannibal Buress is pretty funny. I recently, yeah. actually, I I have I had stayed away from Dave Chappelle for a long time because I was like, why would you do that? Dave Chappelle so that's funny. what I'm saying is there was some part of me that was just <laughs> like, oh, Dave Chappelle, he's like one of those guys that like uh, I'm not that not the kind of comedian I'm supposed to be into. And then it was like I was hanging out with our buddy Christian, watching Dave Chappelle comedies, and I was like, this is the funniest yeah, thing ever. Dave Chappelle is hilarious. Yes, yeah, absolutely hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. But anyway, I want you to listen to the Bo Burnham self-titled album. Well, I will you and I saw him that. perform what, which I think is his worst album. So I, w- is which like, is crazy because I thought that show was hysterical. Yeah, it was. It was free too, which didn't hurt. Yeah, it was also like a YouTuber that I'd heard of doing a live show that I could go to for free. for free. Yeah, and he. But like I said, the only joke I remember from that there were several. But the the, the joke I mainly remember from that Prolonged was one of the little eye contact, one of the little uh, regionalisms that that was thrown in there <laughs> about not everybody can not everybody can be a captain. <laughs> not everybody can be a captain. That that is the thing that has stuck with me like so hard compared to most stand up comic things. Now, granted, I could I could I have this habit where I accidentally memorize stand up comedy, good, and I'll That's just I'll be. just like repeat it out loud 
almost as if it's my own jokes. I do that, and there's no, no shame in that. They are my jokes. They're not, though. Guess who said that? That was, uh... Oh, who is that dude? The Latin American dude that used to do Late Night? Not Lopez, the other one. Jorge Garcia? No. No. Um, Gabriel Iglesias. No, Gabriel Iglesias is hilarious and original. Oh, man. He used to do Late Night. I don't know who you're talking about. Carlos Mencia. Carlos Mencia. Oh, Mind of Mencia was hilarious. I forgot about oh, that guy. Oh, that dude stole jokes. Yeah, but he was still funny. Yeah, he had he was great hilarious. delivery. Yeah, yeah. It's all about delivery. It is. It's 100% what it's and I, about. And I, like, I'm not going to apologize. Like, I still love Dan Cook. I'm not going to apologize for that. I was literally just about to bring up Dan Cook. I was not going to apologize for that. Why do people not Dane like Cook Dan Cook? Dan Cook has been so anymore? nickelbacked. Oh, I know, but I don't get why. He was funny in Vicious Circle. He was funny in. Dude, that, whatever. What, Harmful was swallowed. I think it's just an audio only one. It's still one of the funniest things I've ever heard in my life. He just shouts a lot, but what's wrong with that? Everybody's got their shtick. I don't know. I like Aziz Ansari. He shouts a lot too. Aziz Ansari is so funny. His stand ups are great. So are Kevin Hart's. Like, I'm not going to pretend Kevin Hart's not funny. That's the good thing about comedy is, like, you can just laugh at it. Like, yeah, it's like laughing is. Laughing is good. I enjoy laughing. Like, you're not a better person because you didn't laugh at this comedian. That being said, I, I've been to very few, like, live comedy performances. I've seen Seinfeld, Brian Regan, Bo Burnham. I don't know if anybody else. You, me, and Hunter went to see that, uh, the guys from Who's Line. That was hysterical. Oh, man, we did. Uh, that Colin Mockery funny. and Brad Sherwood. Yeah. That was I really, miss really funny. Who's Line. Man, that show was unappreciated. You know what was a great? You used to have a roommate who did a convention show called Whose Line Is It Anime? Now, I don't know anything about anime, but that's a genius name. Yeah, that for is a... the best name for a, an anime <laughs> con panel. Yeah. Because, <laughs> that like, is brilliant. <laughs> Whose Line is, is that thing that is like universally adored among people our age who yes. just weren't the poll demographic when it was coming out? No. And it, it also. Like, when we were watching it, it was already rerun. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is it, like, just didn't do that well. Right. It was also, I imagine, very expensive because all those people are famous. Well, there's only three cast, four cast members. There's Drew Carey and Colin Mockery. Wayne Brady. I the other two's names. Wayne Brady and the other guy that we saw with Colin Mockery, and then the fourth was a guest. Yeah. Stephen Colbert was on there a few times. Stephen Colbert is hilarious. Stephen Colbert is hilarious. Although, I, I have not watched a whole lot of him since he took over Letterman. I do miss the Colbert Report, though. I liked the Colbert Report because, like, I, I figured it out immediately, even as, like, a 10th grader in high school or however old I was when I watched the Colbert Report like I figured out immediately like this isn't actually a conservative news source this is like a satire of conservative news right and most people did not understand that it's also just not the worst place to get your news correct but people thought that like the Daily Show was the liberal one and no they were the, the exact Colbert, same show they were the exact same I'll they were both liberal be honest ones. with me the first time that you saw John Oliver on the Daily Show did you not just think it was John Stewart with an accent? I did not, no, but I did think this man needs his own show now. I definitely thought it was just John Stewart with an accent. Really? Yeah. Oh. No, John Stewart was in Big Daddy, so he's a real movie star. That's what I thought about John Stewart for a long time. Because <laughs> he was in Big Daddy. Because he was in with Big what, Daddy. With Frankie like, Muniz? Briefly. No, it was, uh, I think it was the kid from Star Wars, wasn't it? Was it? No, was it? I thought it was Frankie Muniz. Well, no, it's not Frankie Muniz. What movie was Frankie to... Muniz in? He's in Cody Banks. Yeah, no, he was in like a, he was in Liar Liar, maybe? No. Big Fat Liar. He was in Big Fat Liar. Yeah, that's the one I always mix up. Big Daddy. The kid in Big Daddy Agent is... Cody Banks. Oh, it's Cole Sprouse and Dylan Sprouse. Oh, though. good lord. I may have seen Big Daddy once. I'm not going to lie to you. Oh, I've seen... I can probably quote most of the film. I've never been that much into Adam Sandler. I'll be honest with you. I liked this one. Anyway, uh, so... <laughs> Back to things that don't have Adam Sandler and do have another great comedian, Robin Williams. Oh, his stand-up was great. Oh, yeah. His everything was great. Yeah. yeah, he didn't do bad things. Robin Williams is, he is missed. Oh, he's like an American Steve Irwin. Yeah, it's it's very tragic that he was he was taken so soon. Yes. Oh, Captain, my Captain. Yeah, that is a heck of a scene in this movie. The end? The end, yeah, when they all stand up on the desks. But not everyone. I think that's important, that even the best teachers in the world will Don't get not, to everyone. Yeah. Don't get to everyone. And I always think about that in my life. Like, what classes did I have where the teacher was amazing and I didn't get it? Chemistry. No. Everyone else, yeah, but, like, if everybody, if, if that was the case and, like, our chemistry teacher walked out of the room and everybody stood up on the desk, Desk, you and I would have been sitting there. Probably. Not we getting it. Yeah. But I also didn't get chemistry, and neither did anyone else. <laughs> no, none of us got chemistry. <laughs> but I feel like a lot of people learned something that I just didn't. Yeah, they, they figured out. I tell you, um, just one more point on teachers real quick. I saw, I think this movie does a name, teaches an important lesson on how to address teachers. And that Mr. Keating is like so against the grain. He won't respond to sir, but he will respond to Mr. Keating. He won't respond to John. He'll respond to Mr. Keating or a captain, my captain. And I think that's important. I saw a video 
video recently of somebody that like went around to all their teachers and called them by their first name. And it is like the, it is like the, the line in traffic, the line on the road that prevents you from like going into the other lane. How small but important calling a teacher by their like proper teacher name is. I definitely had professors in college that insisted we call them by their first name. And I think it's for the same reason. Yeah. Because they want to be seen as an equal. Right. And it was definitely but a like, weird thing. Like, Mr. Doctor, Professor, whatever. Like, it's all the same. Sir, it's all the same. But you call the teacher by their first name. It's like, that's a weird, a weird thing to do. Yes. And you shouldn't. It's disrespectful. Eh. I think it, I mean, not necessarily disrespectful to the teacher, but I think it's disrespectful to the agreement of the relationship. I guess so. Anytime you start bringing in the word disrespectful things, I get a little bit skittish about it because, I, I don't know, I just have this weird thing about it. Like, who does and doesn't earn respect just by existing? I think teachers do. <laughs> I, I don't, honestly. I don't really think that like that, that, that there is an agreement that I should have to call somebody by this this name or it's disrespectful and, and and a lot of times teachers take it to the wrong stream they're like I'm a doctor you're gonna call me doctor oh yeah no I don't care about that and, and they're like this you. is disrespect and I'm like you haven't done anything to earn my respect right like, yeah you went to doctor school or you got your PhD <laughs> but I wasn't there for that and that's the thing is like you, you'll, you'll generally get my respect until you do something to lose my respect and then I'm gonna tell you that you haven't done anything to earn it right because you haven't if, if, if the position was neutral you have it and then once it becomes negative you have to get it back right. and so that's my thing is like anytime that conversation comes up i get a little bit skittish because people are like well the, the respect is demanded by the position and i'm like it's i just i don't think teachers get into it to be called a certain way i just think it's very important to recognize like that there is there, there's a difference yeah there, there. is definitely a, a, like like what gets me is that like if you are a high school teacher who went through the process as fast as possible you could be as young as like 22 teaching 18 year right and so you have to command a certain deal of respect like this yeah. is the, the line yeah this is the boundary and a lot of those times those are the teachers you see being super weird about it i would be super weird because i definitely it. had professors that were very young in college that were like barely older than the kids they were teaching that were like you're gonna call me doctor whatever right and then i had we're gonna older cool teachers that. that were like you're gonna you can call me bill or <laughs> right. hey or sup prof honestly as long as you're paying attention i yeah, don't care <laughs> if you have if you have a question to ask just shout it out dude like People don't have questions that often. This is awesome. <laughs> um, and those are the, t the professors you can definitely tell are like, it, I don't know if it makes them better professors, but they're professors who are more adjusted into the role for better or for worse. Right. Oh, it's very hot in this room. So you wanted to read some fan reactions. I did. I did. You know, we asked people when we announced this movie to tell us about their their best uh, teacher experience, whether it be um, you know teacher they had or or something. I don't know something like that. And I didn't really filter these responses, but I'm just. Do you want to read one? We have responses from listeners telling us about their favorite teachers. Go for it. Uh, this one comes from Becca Eddowes. She says, "I have a teacher named Miss Gordoki who." Really let me break out of my shell. I've always been a reader, and it was something that all the kids I grew up with knew about me. She was my AP Lit junior year and senior English teacher, and she just really showed me how much literature can change your life. I had never felt so comfortable in a class as when I was in AP in her AP Lit class. One memory that stuck out was when we were discussing character foils, characters that are the same character but on different ends of a spectrum, and a classmate mentioned Draco and Harry, but I said that it's more like Voldemort and Harry because they had very similar up upbringings, were both half-bloods, and yet one chose dark and one chose light. I remember her praise me and almost bringing me to tears because of how impressed she was she said most kids said that my said what my classmates said and she had to correct them but that i was the only kid that had come up with it the right come up with it right away her discussions about what author was trying to say and how everything is connected is actually what brought me to the fan theories and to the super carlin brothers community and eventually you guys hey hey that's us thank you for the referral ben and jonathan she really opened my eyes to author intent and the power of it oh man you're gonna read some stuff in college actually becca i think you're out of college yeah you, i think right how old i becca? have no idea i, ha I no don't idea. have a clue how old there's some theories on if authorial intent matters or not that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> i always was in a classroom between classes discussing fan theories and connections in the potter books or the book we were discussing in class that year i met john green when the fault of our stars came out and i actually had him sign a copy to give her that said to read looking for alaska because i'd been trying to convince her to read it read that the whole year she wrote me a thank you card after talking about how influential that book is and how wonderful he was with his words i still send her his ted talks sometimes because she's the only person i know irl that is in awe with his words as i am and then she says that they send each other fan mail and she's truly the most influential teacher I've ever had, and I'm lucky that I get to call her my friend now, though I will never call her Kate, only Miss Gardoqui. What an interesting last little piece. I did not know that was there. <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a sublime piece of timing there. Right. <laughs> 
That was also a lot longer than I thought it was. I didn't see that there was a C more, so I thought it was just like a couple lines. Not a big deal, Becca. We love your words and we love sharing them. Uh, you were just reading for a you, long time. <laughs> if you want to share this with Ms. Gardoqui, you're more than le- welcome to. Uh, you can send her to patreon.com slash bacon and egg. You want, tell her to cons- you want to read one? What's yeah, you should read one. Where are they? There's some, in the, there's some in the Discord server under hashtag movies. There is a post in the Facebook group. And then I guess you're not logged into the Instagram, but there's a couple DMs there as well. This one was from our Facebook group. By the way, if you didn't know, there's a lot more of you listening than are in our Facebook group per our analytics. You can join our Facebook group. It's free and available for everyone forever. And we try to post at least once a day some sort of discussion topic and you should join it. It's fun. So Robin Asbury in our Discord said, one day we arrived at a classroom and there was a note on the door saying all people with blue or green eyes were to sit on one side of the room, anyone with brown or hazel eyes on the other. That lesson, I was given a low of meaningless work to do as someone with hazel eyes and the blue slash green eyed people were allowed to have fun and play games. My teacher was teaching us not only about discrimination but not to accept the rubbish circumstances in life just because those are the cards were dealt. And even and especially if someone has authority or society itself is telling you what to do. It was the best le- lesson I ever learnt and has given me the confidence to achieve things I never thought I could. I mean that's an important lesson. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Do you do you think the point of that lesson is will one of the hazel eyed people stand up for the injustice? Or do you think the point of the lesson is they won't? I'm not even considering that one of them might. I think that you're just... gonna learn the same lesson whether somebody stands up or not. Because you can always explain the lesson afterward. That's true. If you're a good teacher, well, you might just be like, all right, that was fun. <laughs> that was neat. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> on to the next day. Hang on. Do you want to do you want to do one more? I've got one on, on the gram. So you read one from the I gram, think. and then I can read another So one. that was from our Discord server from Definitely a Woozle. Definitely a Woozle. You're not, you're not into the gram, are you? Me? You just you hey, haven't given just, me the information yet. I know. I just want to shout out uh, Sam Atkinson. Got a new job. Wore a pink shirt on his first day. Very proud of him for that. Fair enough. All right. So this one comes from Say Hennen on Instagram. Uh, they're a band geek, full-time clarinetist, part-time saxophonist, fangirl, and proud Ravenclaw is their uh, personal bio on the gram. Uh, she says, my best teacher was actually my eighth grade band director just because he could tell when we needed a mental break and would tell us funny stories about his life and always relate it back to music. He was just really helpful and always there for students. He was funny, but still managed to keep everyone on task and taught us really great life lessons. He was different from any other teacher I had because he was a band director and didn't care for being a formal teacher. He would let us skip announcements and eat lunch with him. We also had him for three years, so he had a lot longer to really get to know us compared to other teachers and vice versa. That's so cool. I'm so glad people are great teachers. I am too. I want to read a response that is slightly different, but it was also very important to me in that I think this is a very important movie for people to read, watch, watch, Sort of very important movie for people to partake in however they want, uh, whether you want to read the script or whatever. Uh, but it's it's from Tori Wood over on Twitter, the Tori, who a few weeks back watched this movie at kind of our general insistence. It, mm, so it wasn't a, like a directly like, hey, Tori, you need to watch Dead Post Society. It was more of like a, we talked about it, so she watched it. She says, I owe a huge thank you once again to Bacon X23 for putting another incredible film on my must-watch list. I think this is the exact story I needed right now. I only watched it because you both reference it so often and praise it so highly, so thank you. She went on to say, I've never needed to see a, mo- a movie, at- I've never needed to see a movie at a specific time in, in my life as much as I needed Dead Poets Society this week. Everyone deserves a, ch- a teacher who is passionate about their job and their students. A teacher who asks about your weekend and genuinely listens to your answer. Everyone deserves parents who unconditionally love you and support you in what you want to do, not what they want you to do. Everyone deserves friends they could talk to no matter what, even when it feels like the world is falling apart. I'll tell you, there's a few points. She she first points, I think that's amazing. Tori, so happy you watched the movie, so happy we were to help. Um, but really, excellent work for the film. I think there's a few points there. When I watch this movie, the character I most relate to and I think I learned the most lessons from is Neil. Agree, disagree. In, in what way? Or, I think the the way that he leads his friend group, I am very sympathetic to. Like, I, I feel like I come from a world where it's hard to have tough conversations with friends. Yeah. Um, like, I feel like you and I didn't really have hard conversations. No, for a long time. For, like, we were probably friends for about a decade before it was, like, yeah. time to have, like, challenging conversations. Yeah. Until we were probably, like, seniors in college right and uh i go back to that night that you me and chris just stood there crying for no reason for no reason whatsoever telling each other we loved each other yeah because we do always will there's there's a scene in the movie i think i relate to very much uh it's it's towards the end where neil and keating are having the conversation and uh i want to i'm just gonna not say anything and unmute it so i can get the quote right because it's not listed in the quotes i was gonna get it wrong so i'm glad i looked it up uh but the quote is very quick it's just two lines neil is struggling with you know, he's got to tell his father about how he's going to do the play. And 
he's gonna be in it and then he doesn't do it um doesn't tell his dad he does do the play um and he asks keating is there an easier way and keating responds no and i think it's so important like we're in such an era of like awareness of mental health but we're not in an era where it's okay like nobody is okay with confrontational discussions right like e- like everyone will tell you conversing with other humans let alone about your problems is the most horrifying thing in the world and i don't think it's something that's very well taught and he asks is there an easier way keating says no i think it's important for us to know that like we can have hard conversations right with our friends with our parents with our mentors and our colleagues everyone and it's important to know someone and be like know someone you can have hard conversations with but also know that there are people that you're never going to want to have a hard conversation with you need all kinds of friends you do because you need a friend that you can have a hard conversation with and talk about the tough things but you also need friends that you're that you can just blow off steam with right that not that may not ask you about those things but it's not a bad thing right like you need both kinds of friends because you have to have friends where you can just be 100 percent yourself and you need to have friends where you can just kind of absorb into the group right both are so important and and i'm glad that we're in in this era where we're talking about people's problems and we may not have it just right yet but we're definitely a lot closer to it than we have been in the past yeah i'll agree with that um even like watching social media trends over time i feel like in the first decade of social media which i'm going to put from like 2007 to 2017 it was important for your life to always look perfect it's best perfect and i feel like within the past two years and there's gonna be some overlap and you know these aren't perfect dates or anything but i feel like within the past two years it has become almost trendy to be like unapologetically you right if you have a bad day and you're a vlogger to like make a video about how your day sucked right to just be be you live out loud especially on social media like Twitter goes in for that. I love it's like, Twitter. oh, you had a bad day. Let's let's talk about it. Right. And it, it, to to some extent, I think that's probably bad. But to some other extent, I think it's good. It's whatever outlet you need to to get out to people, and whether that's making vlogs or whether it's talking to somebody or whatever you want to do, whatever helps you get you talking about your problems is good. Um, and we also just live in a, in a much more conscious to each other's health kind of era in that like it is okay to tell your friends you love them it is okay to like to feel like that about people correct where it never has been in the past and and i mean it always has been but it's always been kind of socially unacceptable we also live in an era where like because of things like facebook and instagram and twitter like you can know more about somebody that you've only had a few conversations with than you would have ever known about your best friend 30 years right you know just the the amount of knowledge you can gain, even passively, is unbelievable. It is insane. Yeah, you can figure out anything about somebody as long as they put it out there at some point. Right, yeah. If somebody puts it out there, I guess is the... Right, and once somebody chooses to share it, it's like qualifier. everybody can know about it. Right. And it's amazing how much you pick up on. At least me. It's amazing how much I pick up on. Because I'm an amazing friend. I'm the best friend. Yeah, I mean, you talk to somebody in real life, and they're just like, oh yeah, I got a dog. And I'm like, I know. Oh, I know. How's he doing? His name is Browdy. You've had him for about six months now. Did he get over that problem he was having last week? <laughs> right. It's just like, especially for me, it's like I, I have this this elephantine memory where I, I can just kind of remember random interactions I've had with people, you know, kind of everything that I've ever said to somebody, you know, people I've, I met 10 years ago, that kind of thing. And so it's like, I'm used to having to reintroduce myself to people. I'm used to having to, you know, kind of feel like everybody doesn't know who I am. And and so it's just, that's the kind of stuff that I definitely clue in on is that people are explaining it to me and I'm like, yeah, I already know all this, but I'm not going to say that because that makes me weird, but whatever. Right. Mm, so good. I love this movie, Ethan. I don't know if you know I this. do love this movie. This has been a very strange episode of Bacon and Eggs. I've enjoyed it. I have enjoyed you know, it as I think... well. I think it's a very important episode. I think it's a very important movie but it like i said we haven't been our normal selves but that's okay that's okay you know this isn't a be your normal self movie this is a this is a sound your barbaric yop movie that's that's right and i shall sound my barbaric yop ethan in fact i i want to know if you have any final thoughts before we get into our wrap-up section oh my final thoughts are that my uh pop filter is just gonna the bed on me real quick <laughs> I watched it happen. Um, okay, we're just going to kind of hold it for the next 20, 18 minutes. Sounds but good. But I'll figure it out. I think it just needs to be readjusted. Anyway. Um, yeah, they can screw in at the bottom. That's probably what happened. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Uh, this is, this, like I said, this is a super important movie for so many reasons. It, like, it's... It, kids these days need to understand that it's okay to be who you are and that maybe you're not going to go to the college that you you desperately want to go to, but like college is college, dude. It's going to be fine. Yeah, it really is. It's also like... It's a weird dilemma for a high schooler where it's like, I can't believe at 18 they're making me decide what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Which is such a weird thing because I made that decision at 18 to be a music director and I'm not that. And it's weird because every day at 25, I'm sort of making decisions for what am I going to do tomorrow? Like, I feel like it's much easier to seize the day when the pressure of my future isn't on me so much, which I guess is is the moral here. Right. But it's much easier to suck the marrow out of life when you realize that, like, the decisions you make today may affect the future, 
but you can always just make new decisions. Right. Well, when nothing you, is going to be set. When in you stone. realize that the marrow doesn't have to be your first job, it doesn't have to be the girl you're dating when you're 18. It doesn't have to be anything. Right. It's like the, the marrow is going to change over time, or it might not. You might you, maybe when you're 18, you figure everything out. Congratulations. There are plenty of people like that, and there's plenty of people that don't figure it out until they're 40. Like no two human lives are the same. Correct. And that's okay. And that's a good thing. That's what makes us human. Yeah. And like if you're 18 and you want to be a doctor. Like, I don't know how to explain this to you, but I got a like 2.06 GPA at my undergrad and I have a degree in philosophy. And if I decided today that I was going to be a doctor, I could still do it. Yeah, it's just going to be much more difficult for you. I mean, you're just going to have to retake some classes and do some prereqs. It's going to take some time, but I'm not going to die before I achieve it. I mean, I might, you know, due to unnatural causes. But... <laughs> you're not going to die of old age <laughs> in the next five years. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it. It might take a while, but there's no reason why I couldn't achieve that goal. Right. And uh, yes, there are some goals that are, are always going to be a very slim chance of happening. Like if you want to be an astronaut, I'm not telling you not to be an astronaut, but they, they take in very few astronauts. But if you want to be a rocket scientist and work on rocket there's ships. There's lots of jobs out there to be rocket scientists. Yeah, there are plenty of Just jobs. Just because NASA isn't doing all that hot, like there's other companies other than NASA. Right. But yeah, like, and what was the other one? The other one, the one that got me so much growing up was that you're not going to grow up and be in the NFL. Let me tell you. Well, you, there's 55. You were players. never going to be in the NFL. Me? Yeah. Not now. You were. You're too small. I'm not. I'm the same size as Drew Brees. I'm bigger than Drew Brees. Yeah, but you're not Drew Brees. Here's Drew Brees thing. knew he was Drew Brees when he was 12. Is the thing. Like here's here's my thing. I don't think I'm going to be Drew Brees. But there are 1,760 starting NFL players. 55 players to a roster. 32 teams. 55 players That's don't start. Whatever. 50. There are. 55 active roster members to a team. 1,760 active roster active roster players in the NFL. You factor in probably twice that for practice squads and things like that. That's not a small number of jobs. No, and it's then you much more in, than astronauts. Bunch of, yeah, it's much more than people that walk on the moon. And then you also figure that that's just the NFL. And if you want to be a professional soccer player or a professional baseball player, there's like five leagues for that. That's just in America for soccer as well. Yeah. There's, there's like 500 leagues if you want to be a professional soccer player. Yeah. All I'm saying is like your dream to be a professional athletes not that ridiculous it, you're going to be a lot of hard work and you're going to need to figure it out young yeah that, that, you don't have to that, that. sports is one of the kind of things where you kind of need to figure it out when you're a little bit younger yeah generally but even that not always look at forrest gump he became a world championship table tennis player after he was in the military that's right all i'm saying is whatever your dream is it's not ridiculous you can do it i believe in you if you want to work on rocket ships i know a lot of people who work on rocket ships sometimes you have to or sell cars and sell insurance before you become a famous podcaster that's right look at us we're not quite famous yet but we're getting there i have no doubt ethan i'm going to tell you something i have no doubt with this episode coming out we will have passed fifty thousand downloads in our first year of podcasting which was a number that i couldn't have established probably until four months in as a stretch goal like i didn't have any frame of reference for what we were going to be even close to for the first three months there was no idea if right. we were going to upload and have a million downloads overnight or if it was going to be like five it was neither it was and somewhere in the middle. It, it was somewhere in the middle. It wasn't close to the million. It was much closer to five. <laughs> <laughs> right, but it was much more than five. It was much more than five. It was, yeah. So after about three months of doing it, we were like, okay, if we stay on this trend, we'll hit like 30,000 in the first year, I think was the number we came up yeah, with. Yeah, 25 to 30. And now and we let's hit set a stretch goal. at month 11. We, we hit 50,000 at month 11. And that was our goal. Ethan, I'm not going to lie to you. I have no doubt that this is going to be our full-time job one day. And that this is going to be something that we do for a long time. And that we are going to be successful. Right. It may not this. be forever because the internet doesn't work like that. No, but it also might be. It also <laughs> might be. But I, I think that we, we are strong enough to diversify there. But this is, yeah, we're, we're going to get right. there. I have no no problem doubting that. Or I have no doubt. And doubts. I want to thank everyone, everyone who listens to the show for making it possible and for getting us to this point. I love everyone who listens to the show. I really do. We have the best fans. Really I know that do. every community like says that. But I think the reason we have the like, best fans have is because our fans, fans, we really do. I think the reason we have the best fans is because, and fans, feel free to change the culture on this, but our fans are not like, they approach us like we're people. Like very rarely is somebody like, bacon and eggs is the most incredible thing in the whole world. I cannot believe that one of them liked my tweet. Right. That's amazing. <laughs> We'll get those occasionally, and that's fine. Like, what? I'll like your tweet. I'll like anybody's tweet. <laughs> but we also definitely have not a small amount of people that are like, hey, I hated this thing you said about that movie. I love you guys, but you guys are idiots. Sorry about it. We really liked The Last Jedi. I did find out recently that... Ben Carlin didn't reviewed, like The Last Jedi. He no longer likes The Last I Jedi. Was, that's, I was disheartened. That's absurd. Anyway, thanks everybody for putting us on track to make our dream a reality let's rank this movie ethan i think we start with a villain, start ranking. With a villain ranking i think it's neil's, neil's dad, dad or society so funny thing about neil's dad just real quick i saw this a while back i think it was like a dvd on tv thing where apparently during filming uh kurtwood smith who plays neil's dad kind of took robert sean leonard aside and was just like 
you're not taking anything I'm saying to you to heart, right? Like, you know, we're all good. And and Robert Sean Leonard was kind of like, I'm an actor. My parents don't really have a problem with me being an actor. <laughs> so no, I'm not taking it to heart. We're good. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. And apparently, Kurtwood Smith, even though he plays the whole dad in literally everything he's ever been in, is just like one of the nicest guys. I would believe that. I believe that. And he big was time. consistently like apologizing to to Robert Sean Leonard. And he was always apologizing to, to Topher Grace on that '70s I show. I like that Robert Sean Leonard did become a doctor, and he did become a doctor. He it. became. Yeah, he became Wilson on House. Yeah. That always that always made me laugh. <laughs> yeah. And Ethan Hawke became my arch nemesis. You'll get there one day. That's my only goal in life is to be more famous than Ethan Hawke. He's pretty handsome. Not anymore. Every picture I've seen of Ethan Hawke these days, he looks like a like a like a Billy Ray Cyrus impersonator. I don't know about all that. But most guys who have a goatee and longer hair like that, I just assume are who's that Australian country singer? Keith Urban. Keith, Keith Urban. Urban does not Keith have a Urban goatee. Is, no, but that's kind of this kind of long hair and, and stubble. That's what I picture is Keith Urban. <laughs> he is that that soul patch. Yeah. Um. I give I give Red not Red. That's the name of that '70s show. Um. Tom know, Perry. I think, I think he's a good villain. He's a good villain. He's a good representation of parental stress, and societal pressure, societal pressure. I'll give him like an eight. I can get behind that. I can back that. Now, Ethan. I think we should do the breakfast food first. <laughs> you think so? Yeah. <laughs> Um, do you have a breakfast food in mind? I don't know. It's like like cold coffee. I've got. Oh, I disagree completely. I don't know. It's finna woke. It is finna woke, but it's also I think of it as like steak and eggs, but like ribeye, like a really nice steak, like a T-bone or a ribeye or something, like a really nice steak, something you're not supposed to eat for breakfast, but you could definitely suck the marrow out of. Oh, it does have to have a bone. Yeah, think about yeah. that. Yeah, that's that's a good call with the bone thing. Yeah, but that's sort of my approach. Is that it's like it's unapologetically itself it's really whatever you want for breakfast whatever your heart truly desires whatever here we'll i'll circle it back to the mirror of error said ethan to harry potter whatever you look into the to the mirror of error said first thing in the morning and you see yourself eating what a what a statement <laughs> i don't know about all that uh, but okay well because that's i mean that's you know what is your blind ambition is sort of the, the theme yeah that's true that's true i can get behind that i'm about it ethan as we go into the movie ranking the overall movie ranking I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, there is not a world that exists where this doesn't immediately become the number one movie on our list. I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was trying to, trying to avoid a heated discussion with your brother last night, where he was like, really, or, that's the best movie ever? I was like, it's not really about best movie ever. I think it's the most important movie I've ever watched. Yeah, I would agree with that. I also love it more than any movie on this list. Yes. And I think... What What is it beating? The Force Awakens? Yeah. yeah. I'm so comfortable with that. I'm not even going to lie. Okay. I think The Force Awakens might be the best sci-fi movie ever made. So it's number one, then. I, I'm, I'm game. Yeah. No, easily. Okay. Good. Have fun changing all the numbers. Uh, yeah. Every single one of them. Yeah. Dead Poets Society, 1989. I had to update the numbers anyway, because I don't think I, I did it for whatever came before you did Jaws. Not. Yeah, because Jaws is two, and so is Infinity War. That makes Infinity War number four now, which is a little bit better. I loved Infinity War. It's not better than Empire. It's not better than Monty <laughs> Python. Know, it's not better than Thor Ragnarok. It's probably better than Harry Potter and Deathly Hallows Part 2. We might have that a little bit overrated. That's okay. No, I really, I really did enjoy that. I think it's something that doesn't age well. When you're not watching it, it's not as good. But it like it while you're watching it, it really is an exceptional film. Oh, sorry, I had to stand up for a second. I agree with that. It is very good. I mean, so is Infinity War. I'm not trying to say Infinity War is bad. I just I still don't think it's the greatest thing ever ever made. Mm. You know, it's crazy. Jonathan was talking about how Jaws might be his favorite movie of all time. And ben was talking about how Infinity War might be his favorite movie of all time. And then I said, well, what about The Force Awakens? And Ben was like... Oh, that's a good point. Wait, Jonathan said Jaws might be his favorite movie of all time? Oh, yeah. Jonathan's a huge I missed that part. Yeah. I just heard Ben saying that Infinity War was his favorite movie. Yeah. And then I was like, well, hold on. Do you remember that scene in The Force Awakens where they have a lightsaber battle and they're in the woods and it's dark and it's snowing? And he was like, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> This is better than that. This oh, this is way better than that. Neil's death is finna woke, bro. But like, it, it, and on some part, I think that we just bridged the gap from like movies that we talk about to like real movies. We, I mean, Jaws is a real movie. I mean, yeah, but it's still like a big action movie. Yeah. We we bridged the gap from movie to film. Correct. Anyway, yeah, there we go. I'll call it good. Uh, I mean, that was a no brainer for me. Fair enough, no brainer. Well, that's all I got. To you say know what about scene that. we? You know what scene we didn't talk about? What scene? This movie, it's it doesn't have a lot of excellent 
I mean, it's obviously got a ton of excellent dialogue, but it's not the kind of quippy dialogue we usually talk about loving on this podcast. No. And it's not the dialogue between the scenes. It's the dialogue during the scenes. But one of my favorite sort of quippy scenes in cinema is when they throw the desk and uh, and then Neil says, oh my, well, I wouldn't worry. You'll get another oh, one yeah, next year. Oh yeah, one of the year. greatest lines. I just wanted to, to That is that a great one. Because yeah, that, that is so important. The fact that, that like Todd feels all these pressure from his parents and he, he's got to live up to his brother. He's got to live to everybody that he came before him and they want all this for him but they they got him the same thing for christmas two years in a row for his birthday yeah who doesn't even care about it right he's like he didn't like it in the first place and neil is such a good friend in that moment neil's a great friend neil is a great friend who can't practice what he preaches yeah well i mean that's not that uncommon no it's definitely not that uncommon that's like every kid in high school who's never had a girlfriend who gets asked for advice on dealing with girls yeah and then he posts a facebook status like you know i've never had a girlfriend but i really give good advice so if you need anything shoot me a dm yeah Back when we were in high school, the term DM did not exist. <laughs> I don't think Facebook Shoot had me messages. I think it was like, hit me up on AIM. Thank you guys again for listening to another episode of Bacon and Hags. As always, if you want to get in contact with us, all of our information is down in the doobly-doo, the description, the, the pants bar, the towel section, whatever you want to call it. It's over there on the left, it's up there on the top, it's over there on the right, it's on the next page, it's down below. Contact information's everywhere. Our artwork is by Vaishon Brandon of Graphite, and our music is by Citrix. Citrix? Skitrix? His info's, His info's down, below. down below as well. <laughs> Everybody's info's down below. If you want to buy stuff from us, it's down below. If you want to join the Patreon, also down below. You can get thank you cards right now at patreon.com slash bacon and eggs. As Ty told you at the top of the episode, or maybe the middle of the episode. Somewhere in the episode. Normally the top, this time in the middle. Anyway, all of the stuff you need to know is down below in that bar. So I'm not going to say it again here because I just said most of it. Tyler, do you have any final thoughts on this movie? Nope. Do you have any final thoughts on life? Many. Tell me one final thought. Hmm. Oh, God. <laughs> final thought. That was quick. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're going to say if, if death arises from the, the ground right now and says, hey, Tyler, your time's up, buddy? I mean, there's nobody else to tell these proverbs to. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, I've been, I've been Ethan Etchell. He's been Tyler Carlin. We we appreciate you guys so much for listening to this episode of Bacon and Eggs and all episodes of Bacon and Eggs. If you love the show, tell a friend. If you don't love the show, tell a friend. If you feel neutral about the show, tell a friend. Make them make their own opinions by listening to the show. That's all I got to say about that. This has been Ethan Etchell. This has been Tyler Carlin. This has been Bacon and Eggs. And until next week, arrivederci. A farewell to false love. Farewell, false love, the oracle of lies. A mortal foe, an enemy to rest. An envious boy from whom all cares arise. A bastard vile, a beast with rage possessed. A way of error, a temple full of treason, and all effects contrary unto reason. A poison serpent covered with all with flowers. Mother of sighs and murderer of repose. A sea of sorrows whence are drawn such showers as moisture lend to every grief that grows. A school of guile, a net of d- deep deceit, a gilded hook that holds a poison bait a fortress foiled which reason did defend a siren song a fever of the mind a maze wherein affection finds no end a raging cloud that runs before the wind a substance like the shadow of the sun a gre- a goal of grief for which the wisest run a quenchless fire a nurse of trembling fear a path that leads to peril and mishap a true retreat of sorrow and despair an idle boy that sleeps in pleasure's lap a deep mistrust of that which certain seems a hope of that which reason doubtful deems sith then then thy trains my younger years betrayed since and for my faith and gratitude i find and sith repentance hath my wrongs be rayed whose course was ever contrary to kind false love desire and beauty frail ado dead is the root whence all these fancies grew a uh, sweaty tooth madman <laughs> What was that poem? Uh, it was A Farewell to False Love by Sir Walter Raleigh.